As we finish up this series, it's something that this is a message that I look forward to. I, 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 as I prayerfully considered what our next step would be when I looked at this a few months back, this was the sermon I was excited to preach. And the closer it got, the more intimidating it became. God's word can be intimidating sometimes, amen? amen? You ever open up the word of God and get really intimidated? Wow, that's a lot to take in. So my message has gone from five verses, down to four verses, down to one, and it still hasn't gotten any less intimidating. We've been talking about what our foundations of our faith is. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you cannot have, you cannot not have a, an, a life of prayer. Prayer is, is essential to your walk with Jesus. Just as essential is that worship. Do you worship him? And I'm not asking, do you wait till Sunday to do so? Do we read the word? Do we study the word? Do we make disciples? That's what we talked about last week. I, you know, I didn't know what the focus was. I just I signed up for my my district training yesterday, and there are all the different little breakouts that they had, and every one of them I took a I made a decision on discipleship. I wanted to hear from different areas of what they were doing with discipleship because I believe that we're good in that, but I want to take it to the next level. I want to be intentional because that's what God's called us to be. So it was kind of cool to hear some of the same verses I preached on last week. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Go and make disciples of all nations. Teaching them. Baptizing them. And I will be with you till the end of all ages. So you, you have a lot of what I thought of some of the very basic foundations of our faith is. I want to finish it here because this is not my words, it's his. I say that again, this is not Daryl's words. This is Jesus' words. Luke 9, 23 through 27 was in your, I believe in your bulletins. When I finally printed this out, I forgot to change it. It went down to 26 and it's just going to be the 23rd. Then he said to them all, church say all. Oh. Man, I like them little words. <laughs> if I ever said that before, I like those little words. Whoever wants to be my disciple, church say once. Once. I want you guys to remember these words. If you want to be my disciple, must, must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Pray. Father, your word, your instruction, may your word live in us. May your word sculpt us into who you want us to be. As sharp as your word can be to pierce through the hardest of hearts, may we hear your words, not Daryl's. Not the Nazarene's words, but your words. May your words ring true in our lives. It's in Jesus' holy name. Amen and amen. I want to read some of the context. Jesus just got done predicting his death to his people. And when, when he said, I always thought that he was just talking to the disciples, just the father. No, he was talking to the entire crowd. All. All. Those little words, all. Moving on in that very text, it says, For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for me will save it. Then he asks questions. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self or soul? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them. When he comes in glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. And yet, people want to think that Jesus was just about love. He's all about the good stuff. 
The warm stuff. Friends, if we look at these words and they're read in my Bible, they're harsh words. Are you ashamed of me? I think someone yelled at a rally. Jesus is Lord. And their response was, you're in the wrong place. Friends, that sounds like shame. These are harsh words. If you lose your life for me, then you will save it. I don't know about y'all, but there's some things in this life that I really enjoy. But I want to go back to that first verse. It's for everybody. I looked at all. Again, I, I'm still relearning the word of God. Anybody who hasn't opened up the Word of God and didn't learn something, then go back and read it again. There's stuff in there that we can learn. And he says all, and every single input, every single commentary said he was talk, he's still talking to the multitudes. The parallel passage in Mark says he calls everyone to himself. See, he gets personal when we get close to that camera. Come to me, I've got something to say to you. I want you guys to get this. Are you hearing? And I don't really care if the camera loses me or not, son, so don't worry about it. She's like, I don't think we can zoom out anymore, Dad. You got an eye. I want you to get this. He just, I'm going to die. I'm going to suffer a horrible death. So pay attention got everybody's attention almost I wonder if there's anybody in the crowd with Jesus where they were doing their own thing checking which, which restaurant do we go to we got to be we got to be the big church down the street <laughs> see Jesus wanted to have their attention whoever Whosoever believes in me will not perish, but have everlasting life. P, use that word, whoever. It just opened the day or door for everybody. But just because there's an open door doesn't mean you have to walk through it. Friends, I'm going to ask some hard questions today. Are you willing to walk through that door? Let's say you haven't, you've already made that decision. Are you ready to go through that door again? Whoever. Wants. Church say wants. 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 This is easier without the slides. I don't have to worry about this. Oh. Do you want it? You have to desire. The God we serve wants a willing participant. He doesn't want to force us to do something. I think that's part of the, the hardest thing about being a pastor right now is, is when people don't want it. They come in and they, they sit on a pew and they clap their hand. Like, Amen, Brother Don. That was a good one. I like that song. Oh, I don't like that one. I'm going to have to tell him later. Oh, it's time to go. We have to want to follow him. Mm -hmm. We're told over and over that, that he desires that everyone will come to know repentance through him. But we can't force it. One of the first things they did at the training thing yesterday is the message was over the prodigal because if you don't have a heart for the prodigal, then how do we expect you to have a heart for the stranger? I thought about prodigals. I thought about family members. I thought about people that came and sat in these pews. People I've gotten to know and love over the years. Where are they now? I can't force them. I thought about people that my words made them angry and they left. Did I chase them off? And then the word of God came back to me and said, 
whoever wants to be my disciple, Daryl, not yours. That doesn't mean I don't have a broken heart for the people. No, not yet. Do you want to follow Jesus? I love when John Wesley has things to say. It was the first book I bought as a, as a pastor. When I got here, the very first book I wanted to buy with my own money outside of school was John Wesley's commentary. It's one book. He doesn't have everything. He doesn't have things to say on everything. But he sure did have a lot to say about this one. Some of those words was not only was it voluntary, but if one decides to do so, the conditions are commanded. This is what scares me about this message, this one little verse. I did that dramatically earlier, but I'm going to go back to it. That one verse. Whoever wants to be my disciple must. You have to do this. Here's a list. A pastor, we want to be encouraged. We want you to lift us up. I'm never going to water down the gospel. Because there's so many people that do. And that watering down gospel leads straight to hell. <clears throat> Don't think that I'm just up here preaching because this one had an effect on me this week. Total commitment. There's no such thing as a part-time Christian, friends. We can't just follow Jesus from the hours of 1030 on a Sunday till noon-ish whenever pastor decides to quit yapping and then go to lunch. That's not even a part-time job. It's a part, 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 part-time job. Oh, but I, I attend Sunday nights too. Okay, so that's a whole two and a half hours a, a week. Congratulations. Jesus wants a commitment 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I question myself this week, am I giving it? If I drag my feet on certain areas, am I testing God's patience? 2 Peter 3.9 tells us that God is patient. He is slow to his promise and... He wants everyone to come to repentance. Am I testing his patience? You guys know I'm in Job with my brothers and, and on my interstate thing. And this was the very last chapter today. And Job falls on his face in humble repentance. You're right, Lord. You've asked, you've asked of me and I have to answer. And I cannot answer. I'm not worthy enough. And God finally says, you get it. Full time. There's three conditions that he's asking for. First one is to deny yourself. You got to give it up. Deny yourself. Galatians 2.20, Paul states that he'd been crucified with Christ so that it is Christ that lives in me. I no longer live. His desires, God's desires, is not my desires. Man, that's such a hard message to hear in today's society when we talk about be your best you. Look out for number one. Friends, we're not even number two. He's number one. shared earlier that, you know, I was one that ran from the call of God. I wonder how many souls perished because of that. 30 years of running. Oh, I was good in a lot of different areas. I used to, I used to follow those Kirby salesmen. Y'all remember the Kirby vacuums? I used to follow them around just to, just to take up their brand new machine and to set it in front of their office the next day and take pictures of me doing so. I would sell a different brand right behind them, tell them, give me 30 seconds, I'll give you 50 reasons why you shouldn't have spent all that money. 
And then I'm going to take that debt off your shoulders. And I'll give you another debt, but it's a lot less. Man, I was 100% successful. I moved 25 machines in two days one time. Just following around. Man, they were so upset with me when I showed up with 25 of their brand new Burbies. I was good at selling home security systems. I was good at selling pharmaceutical, compound pharmaceuticals from my office. Man, I sat in my office in, in New Pensacola, and my residual sales was enough to pay the rent, put food on the table, live comfortably, and be able to do full-time ministry without getting paid. It's great. God said, you're not denying yourself, Daryl. He wants us to deny ourselves. It doesn't mean that we have to live in poverty. It doesn't mean we don't go to work. It doesn't mean that we should all go into ministry. But I'm going to tell you, if God's calling you into ministry, you need to let me know so we can start preparing the way. It didn't happen overnight for me. He says, I want you to deny yourself. Why is it that Jesus says the first thing is we've got to deny ourselves? I wonder if pride was a big issue back then as it is today. It's not about what you want. It's about what God wants to accomplish through you. He can do that if you're in the medical field. Amen, Doc? He can do that if you're in the real estate field. Isn't that right, Miss Mary? I know Miss Chastity works in the hospital. God can work through Miss Chastity too. But see, it's not about what we want to do. It's about what God wants to do through us. See, when we start thinking about what we want and what we want to do is so small compared to what God can do through us. It's so small. But see, the first thing that we can do is we have to deny ourselves. How do I get a picture of that? It's funny. They all said, refer to Matthew. A lot of times when, with, with commentaries, they don't want to repeat the words. They just say, hey, refer back to this one. So now you got to go look up this one. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all said the same thing. They all recounted the same words. Luke said daily. And that daily indicates fresh. We'll get to that in a minute. Self-denial. If we don't deny ourselves, we can't do the next step. Did Jesus deny himself? <laughs> I want to be like Jesus. Do you really? I want to. What would Jesus do? Well, Jesus would deny himself. After we deny ourselves, he says we need to, I'm going to ask you to carry your cross. Huh. I still don't have a full understanding of what carry your cross means. I think of what Jesus did. How the human restrictions, the human body and the flesh body restrictions that he had carrying that cross up that hill to Golgotha. When we were in the shipyards, uh, we had this barge, and that's where we put all our administrative offices, and they had, you know, barges are metal. The walls are metal. But we had to hang one of the information, like, bulletin boards that had the glass that come out and locks, and you'd, you'd have to need a key to get into it. But we had to hang it, and, and I'm over there just, just chit-chatting. I went ahead and put my, wall, my, my shoulder against the wall. And the drill bit hit me right in the eye. <laughs> Doc laughs. Because, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, but I tell you, it didn't hurt. Ironically, but all I saw was this wall of red. Hmm. Why did I think of that this week? I threw a crown of thorns on his head. I remember in 1981 when we were in a car accident and my mom had cuts on her face. I didn't know who she was. It was just this woman with her face covered in blood. Apparently you bleed a lot when you cut your face. Did Jesus have a restrictive eyesight carrying that cross? He 
carry the cross. What does that mean? Jesus is asking us exactly what he did himself. He could have snapped his fingers and it would have been done. He took another step. That voice in his head, but you're God, you can stop this right now. Took another step. The weight of that wood bearing down on his shoulder. Too much for a human heaven, a, hu a human body to endure. So another guy named Joseph came and helped him carry it. Who's going to help carry your, look around. Look to your left, to your right. If you're sitting in the aisle by yourself, look behind you. What did he experience? What was he thinking? I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, it's not written in the Bible, but this is just Daryl's interjection. He was thinking about you and me. Was thinking about how Daryl was going to run from him for 30 years. And Daryl's ego would be too loud for him to just follow me. His desire for power would be too much to just pick up the cross. It's a sermon I watched once and the pastor asked, why... Why did Jesus do it? Nobody else would have been able to do it. Everyone else would have been. Why am I carrying this cross for someone who's going to just get what they want out of me? Then they're going to leave and do their own thing. Forget you. I don't want to do that anymore. I'm not strong enough to do that anymore. Yet he took another step. The weight of that wood on his shoulders. My face on his mind. The time that I walked from him in his memory. Carry your cross. Sometimes I get frustrated when I go inside the jail. Oh, I love talking about my brother Matthew, and I hope he gives a testimony one of these Sunday nights. But do you realize there are two dozen other Matthews that I got to see and I don't get to see anymore? I wonder if Jesus felt that same betrayal. <clears throat> Daryl, you did the same thing. Don't you dare call anybody else out. Jesus said not only to take up your cross... But in Matthew 10, 38, he said, if you don't, you're not worthy to be my disciple. Oh, that's not the good comforting words we like to hear from the Bible now, is it? <clears throat> you're not good enough to be my disciple if you're not willing to take up your cross. Lord, I want to be worthy. Do you, Daryl? Do you know the cost? He hasn't made it great. It's either black or white. You, you can't vote for everybody on Tuesday. You can only vote for one person. There's only one bubble that you can vote, vote for every single office. And Jesus is saying, if you do not circle my bubble, you're not worthy to take the vote. There should be a self-sacrifice here. What's on your cross, friends? Who is on your cross, friends? You notice when Jesus carried that cross, it wasn't for his own financial heartaches. It wasn't for who's going to be the next Caesar. It wasn't for his health <laughs> conditions. He carried his cross for others. For you and you and me. Who's on that cross? I thought of Jason's daughter. 
She's come to this church just a couple of times. Her name's Miranda. That precious little baby that they've got. He's adorable. 104.7 degrees he got up to. Parents, take a minute and think about that. How helpless do we feel when our kids are sick? I cried out in prayer, Lord. I don't know how mom and dad are doing it. That's part of a cross. If you're not feeling that for somebody else, pick up a cross. If we all picked up crosses, I wonder how many, what the effects of that cross carrying would be. I'm not just talking in this sanctuary. Sanctuaries up the street and down the street and across town. What would it be when we started carrying our cross? Carrying that cross led to transformations. Now there's good news in that cross, friends. Do you believe there's good news in the cross of Jesus Christ? Amen. You remember the guy that was on the cross right next to him? The thief on the cross, there was transformational power in that cross. Had Jesus not carried his cross, had he snapped his fingers and said, I'm done with it all, the man on the cross would have slid straight into hell. What about the soldier that said, surely this was the son of God? Friends, when we carry our cross, his power starts transforming those around us. Amen. Introverts, I don't care if it's not your style. You need to tell people about your story. We have an opportunity for that coming up. If you don't have any questions, come see Mr. Don after, after service. Because your story of carrying your cross can lead to others' redemption. There's a couple faces in the pew with Matthew. I'm, a, I'm assuming he may have told them a story. Carry your cross. You can't carry a cross unless you denied yourself. I ain't got it in me to carry a cross unless I've denied myself. The last thing he asked was to follow him. Take a step. what he said to the first disciples. You know that they did not believe that he was Jesus Christ when they first met him? They didn't know he was the son of God. Just some guy come by and said, hey, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. It takes obedience. We have to deny ourselves. We have to sell, we have to sacrifice before we can follow him. It takes action. Forward movement in that direction. Every step he took was one forward. He didn't stop and go back. He took another step forward. Blood coming in front of his eyes. Muscles aching with pain, throbbing from being beaten. The, 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 the wind touching his open wounds. He took a step. With your face on his mind. With my face on his mind. And he wants us to follow. He wants us to sacrifice our desires so that others may find redemption. Jesus said, I am the way. If I follow anybody else, I'm going in the wrong direction. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. It's like the third week I brought that scripture up. It just can't, keeps coming back. But I'm the way. Got to pick up a family today for church. 
And I realize that there's a, there's a detour, there's a, there's a closed street, I gotta go a different way. Friends, there's only one way to be his disciple, and that's with a cross on our back. That's with denying ourselves and going in the direction that he wants us to go. This was not my life that I picked out. My life was sitting in a kitchen wearing sweatpants and a t-shirt until I needed to do a video call and I put on a sports coat over that t-shirt. They didn't have to know that I was in shorts or sweatpants. He says, it's not about you. It's about what you can do for me. As friends, as much as I enjoyed selling my pharmaceuticals from my kitchen, I would have not traded this for anything in the world. Because I do get to see transformations. I get to see people that will deal with the loss of a parent and come put on a trunk or treat out of nowhere. And then I get to go to a meeting with other pastors and go, how did you get all that? We live in a bigger town. We did the same things you did. In order for God to work through that person, they had that God had to do work in that person. That person denied themselves. And that's why I bring call out Mrs. Lisa. Because she embodies what denying herself looks like. I've got stories for a lot of you. Don't stop denying yourself. Don't stop carrying that cross. And then continue following him. If you lose your life for me, he says, you will gain everything in the world. If you lose your life for me, you'll gain everything in the world. I just want to be, I want more of Jesus. Even if that means carrying a cross that I can't stand to bear. Even if that means living in a parsonage. <laughs> Even if that means who knows about retirement? One of the one of the things I, I didn't go to was a retirement was, was thing on retirement. I'm like, ah, I'm not going to retire. I'm just going to die. I'm going to let the church pay for the funeral. <laughs> my father-in-law said, "Just leave my body on the side of the road. And let the city handle it." <laughs> in reality I want to be like that Pastor Ken who poured into me and said I don't care Des is standing at the door I see him every stinking morning but until he steps foot into this room I'm going to talk to the nurses about Jesus I'm going to talk to the orderlies about Jesus you want to come in and, 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 and wipe my backside I'm telling you about Jesus how's that for an awkward conversation was his cross two weeks the, head, the weight of that cross got so heavy on him but that was him losing his life for Christ what is losing your life for Christ look like what is on your cross who is on your cross Jesus had some harsh words here. I'm going to ask some of them, one of my musicians to come up. We're going to go to a static picture. Let me know when we are there. Because I am going to ask for folks to deny themselves. 
you can't kneel and come sit on the front row. The front row is full, sit on the second row. I know we, some of us still got knees we can work, we can use. But we have to deny ourselves. If you're ashamed of me, he said, whoever is ashamed of me and my words and the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. I'm going to ask you, are you willing to carry your cross? Are you willing to deny yourself? I'm going to be the first to say, here I am. There's still some self-denial I need. There's still that cross that I want to, I'm going to have to carry on my own. But I'm going to come to my knees. And I'm gonna say, I'm gonna I'm gonna lay that cross. So Lord, I need I need you to give me that cross. Even if it's too heavy, I know I have my wife to help me out with that cross. We're gonna go to a season of prayer. I'm gonna encourage you to deny yourself. Pick up your cross. The way is on our knees. you will your will will be done your harvest will come Lord we love you right now as we pray we are surrendering everything to you we surrender all we will trust in you time you need to pray, friends. Surrender all.
You ever wonder what we do on Tuesday nights? It's that. We pray for people. There are results. This is part of the sermon that I kind of cut out. If you lose your life for me, I'll save it. That's what Jesus said. The things that we have in this life are pointless. People are what matter. Father, we come to you right now and we say thank you. For those that have a stronger conviction in their life, Lord, I ask that you foster that. You give them the courage and strength to reach out so that we can grow that conviction. We can grow that courage. Lord, we just want to be closer to you. It's in Jesus' holy name. Amen and amen. If you're online, I want to say thank you for joining us. We are going to be observing communion today. Those in the house, you know that communion is open for all. For those online, know I love you and I'm praying for you. Have a great rest of the week.